you have your uh, Bibles today, turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Last Sunday we spoke of the contrast between David and Saul. And I pointed out that one of those contrast was that Saul uh, or, uh, Saul did not care for worship, but David loved worship. And I want to pick up on that theme this morning. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it's one of the first thoughts that David has when all his enemies have been defeated. Let's, I'm going to read 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 to 3. When the king had lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the Lord dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go and do all in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And so Nathan gives the green light to David, but then... Picking it up in verse 4, he has to go back to David because God comes to Nathan and says, not quite so fast. Um, I haven't asked for a fancy house to dwell in. That's what God says to David. Now, uh, just a side note, 1 Kings 8 tells this same story and adds that God said to David, but you did do well that it was in your heart. You know, sometimes we don't get to do things, but we, are, we intend to do something for good, for God, for his kingdom. And God says, well, it's good that it was in your heart. But what Nathan comes back to David with when David has this desire and ambition to build a magnificent temple for God instead of him being, instead of the place of worship being a little tabernacle or tent, Nathan comes back uh, and basically begins to give to David a history of what God has done for him. For example, in verse 8, he says, uh, verse 7, In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, uh, did I ever speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? I, I, in other words, that I never brought it up. But verse 8 says, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following sheep, that you should be a prince over my people Israel. So he says, Nathan goes to David and says, Well, God told me to remind you that you were a little shepherd when God came to you. And he protected you, saved you from the lion and the bear when you were a little shepherd boy. And now he's made you king over Israel. And then in verse 9, he tells him something else. He said, And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. In other words, David's battles, which were many, uh, God gave him victory in every one of them. In fact, if you read the story of David, the history of the Old Testament, David fought so many battles, but... There's no record he ever lost a single battle. So God says, I have cut off all your enemies and you've never lost a battle in verse 9. It's, it's as if God is saying to David, I appreciate what you want to do for me, but your life is not about what you can do for me. Your life is about what I have done for you. I have brought you up as a shepherd, made you king of Israel. 
I have cut off all your enemies. God gives him a little history lesson on what his life is all about. Sometimes we forget that God, it's about God doing things for us that we cannot do. Not what we can do for God. It's not about the demands of our faith, but it's about the supply of God's grace. And then God goes on and still not saying anything about whether he wants him to build a temple or not, but he starts in verse 9 by saying, I'm going to continue to do some things for you. I've done these things for you. I've made you a king and when you were a shepherd boy and cut off all your enemies, now I'm going to do some more things for you. And so starting in verse 9, he says, I've been with you wherever you went and cut off all your enemies. And notice this, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. There's actually three promises that God gives to David regarding his future. And I want to point these out to you. In verse 9, I will make of you a great name. Your name will be associated with greatness. And you can go anywhere in the world and people know the story of David and Goliath and who won. In fact, sometimes when an individual goes up against a corporation, they call it a David and Goliath story. In other words, his life became a template or a, a paradigm for facing impossible odds. I, I googled David and Goliath. And I got 16,700,000 articles. <laughs> now, let me just tell you, I didn't read all of them. <laughs> In fact, I didn't really read any of them. But I, did, I, did, I was impressed with the numbers, the sheer numbers, in which just the story of David and Goliath is out there. And God told David, I'm going to make you, I'm going to give you a great name. I'm going to make you famous. And then in verse 10 and 11, he tells him he's going to do something else that hasn't been done before. He says, I'm going to give your people over whom you dwell a safe place in the land. Look at verse 10. And I'll appoint a place for my people Israel. I'll plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men will afflict them no more as formerly. I'm going to give Israel, over which you rule, a safe place. And there won't be constant battles but your victories will drive off once and for all the enemies of Israel. In fact, in the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 3, it says that David's victories, his armies, went all the way to the Euphrates River, which is in modern-day Iraq, Euphrates River. Uh, give me that uh, map, if you would, this is, this blue is the size of David's kingdom. And it goes all the way up to modern Iraq, through Syria, Lebanon, half of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, which is across the river. Little Israel, you see the red arrow? That's just a tiny sliver of Israel. David's kingdom is a hundred times bigger than Israel. And it goes all the way down to the river of Egypt, the Nile River. 
And 1 Kings 4.21 says Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines to the borders of Egypt. And they all brought tribute to him all the days of his life. What David won, Solomon ruled over. So God gave Israel this phenomenal safety, which, by the way, that is, these boundaries are the exact boundaries mentioned in Genesis 15, 18 that God promised to Abraham from the, from the Nile River all the way up to the Euphrates. So that David fulfilled the promises God made to Abraham. Now some people, you'll hear some preachers today, on, especially on the radio, they'll say that modern Israel is the fulfillment of prophecy. But if you look at modern Israel, they don't even control all of that little sliver of land right there. They, they don't control the West Bank. They don't control half of Jerusalem. They don't control the Temple Mount. They don't control down in Gaza, the area of Philistines. It's about a 50 by 150 mile radius. But David, there's no question but that he fulfilled that prophecy God gave to Abraham. So God says, David, I am going to give you this phenomenal kingdom. It's going to be a safe place for God's people for the first time in history. And then a third thing he says he's going to do for him is in, in also verse 11, the second part of verse 11, he says, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that he will make you a house. Now remember that David's come, he's, a, he's thinking about building a house for God, not, a, not that tent. And God's telling him what he's going to do for David. He's going to make him a great name. He's going to give him a great people of, of, that's safe. And he's going to build him a house. Wait, I thought I was going to build you one. No, David, I'm going to build you one. Now this is not a house of brick and mortar. This is a household. This is a family. Uh, let's read on in verse 13 and 14. He says, He will build a house for my name, or verse, uh, start with verse 12. When the, your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, in other words, when you die, I'll raise up your offspring after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I'll discipline him with the rod of men. In other words, uh, I'm going to adopt when you die your son will still have a father. It'll be me. And if he gets out of line, if he misbehaves, I'll spank him. But look at what he says. Verse 15, My steadfast love will not depart from him like I took it from Saul. I will never leave this man, this child of yours. When you're gone, you won't have to worry about your children. I'll see to them. I'll adopt your son as my son. I'll be a father to him. He'll be a son to me. If he gets out of line, I will spank him, but I will never leave him or forsake him like I did with Saul. In other words, God has broken in to the Old Testament with new covenant promises. This is amazing. I mean, I have a son. I have three daughters and a son. I can't imagine uh, how it would feel if God spoke those words to me. I will adopt your son as my son. I will never leave him. I'll spank him. I'll see to it. So when you 
die, you won't have to worry about your son. What a promise. I will build you a house, verse 11 and 12, means a household, a family of God. All of your family will be mine. And I would just add this. I know that some of you today are worried about your house. Uh, God puts the emphasis on your household. Amen? It's not what you live in. It's who lives in it with you. Your family. That is the concern of God here with David. David, you're interested in an outward house. But I'm interested in your family. And I want to build you a family. You think I'm interested in what you're going to do for the church. God says, I'm interested in your family line that they be a people of faith and love to God. So David here is overcome with these promises. All God has done is tell him what he's done in the past. Verse 8 and 9, he's made him a prince over Israel. He's cut off all his enemies. He's then told him what he's going to do in the future, make him a great name, give him a safe place for the people, and give him a new family dynasty of godly men and women. He's going to adopt his son as his own. So David, and this is in verse 18, goes in and sits before the Lord. Now usually the Jewish stance of prayer is standing before the Lord. When you went to pray, you went and you stood before God and usually you raised your hands like this. For example, Genesis 18, 22, when Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, it says he stood before the Lord. Or in Mark chapter 11, when Jesus is teaching us about prayer, uh, Mark eleven twenty five, 25, he says, uh, you're praying in front, you want uh, the mountain to move. And he says, when you stand praying, forgive everyone. So the idea is you, that the, the typical stance of prayer is that of standing up before God. But David sits before the Lord. Have you ever been so overcome with amazement that you just sat down before God? What moved David to sit and I think it's in the fact that what he recognized was coming from God. And let me give you these three things uh, as we summarize this from David. Why, why is David so moved? Verse 18. King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house? that you have brought me this far. And, he, and then he asked, and yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. That's verse 18, the first part of verse 19. Here's the first thing that David saw. Of all that God had done, I mean, he's made him a king. He's given him victory everywhere. From the river Nile up to the river Euphrates. All that God has done, which is big to David, he says, this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. All that God has done is big to me, but it's small to God. Small to God. It's effortless. God can make a king or a blade of grass with equal effort. Remember that he made the galaxies with a simple pronouncement. Two men were discussing 
whether there was life on other planets. And one said, why would God go to all that trouble to make the galaxies if there were not life? And the other man said, what trouble? There wasn't any trouble. He spoke, let there be light, and there was light. David recognized that everything God had ever done for him, that was a small thing to God. Have you thought about that? Some of you have experienced healings in your body. Some of you have experienced financial provision, miraculous. Some of you have experienced healing in your marriages. Other things. If, if I gave opportunity for people to give a, their story today, it would be an amazing array of what God has done. And I want to tell you, these are small things to God. God can do these effortlessly. Here's, but here's something else. This is in verse 19 also. This was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. Verse 19, the second part. You have spoken also of your servant's household for a great while to come. Now here's a couple of these versions. Give me the, uh, the version, the NIV and the message. This is 2 Samuel 7, 19. Here's, here's the way they put it is if this wasn't enough, that is what you've done for me. You have also spoken about my future. And I like the message, the way the message version puts it. He says, that's nothing for what you've done for me. That's nothing compared to what's coming. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, let that sink in a minute. All that God's done for me. And hasn't God been good? I mean, when you put it all together, at this point in life, can't we look back and say, God's done so much for me. Would you just say amen, somebody? And, and it says, the way the message puts David's comment is, that's nothing compared to what's coming. <laughs> So here's what David also recognized, is that the past, though wonderful, is small compared to the future. Now let that sink in. No matter how good God has been, God promises to be even better. Praise God. Praise God. Take, for example, the story of Moses. Deuteronomy 34.10 says that there is no prophet risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He did all those miracles and signs and wonders in Egypt to Pharaoh and all his officials in the whole land. No one has ever shown the mighty power performed the awesome deeds Moses did in the sight of Israel. Well, you can't go better than Moses, right? But then Jesus. Moses said, bring a sacrifice, but Jesus said, I'm the sacrifice. Moses said, Here's the law of God on tables of stone, but Jesus said by the Holy Spirit, here it is in your heart. Moses said, I have to die. No one will know where I'm buried, but Jesus died and rose again and showed himself to many. Jesus is better than Moses, but Moses was so good. How could we ever leave Moses? Folks, don't get stuck in the good, good things of God in your past. God's got better things in your future. Look at the book of Job. Job starts out, he's blessed materially, but he ends up blessed materially and spiritually. 
he ends by having everything restored and he says, Lord, I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. God has blessed us in the past. Yes, praise his name. But the future is going to be better. That's a Christian principle. That's why uh, Jesus in John chapter 2, verse 10, they said to Jesus at the wedding feast when he turned the water into wine, they said, Lord, you have saved the best wine to last. God always saves the best till the last. You haven't been into God's best yet. You haven't lived long enough. David recognized that the past was small and wonderful, but insignificant compared to what God is promising him here in the future. And then there's one other thing. Nathan says to David, God took you from being a shepherd and made you a king. He cut off all your enemies. But now there's nothing compared to the future because he's going to give you a good name. He's going to give your people a safe place. And your son will be adopted as his son. He will never let him go. And David recognized that this principle of the future is better no matter how good the past was for everybody. Look at, this is a wonderful little phrase. I'm going to read verse 19. Yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You've spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And then this phrase. And this is Torah or the law or the principle for, and the Hebrew word there is Adam. Um, it's translated mankind in the English Standard Version. This is the instruction. This is the lesson or law for mankind. What is the, what's the lesson? That you have brought me thus far, and it's a small thing, but you have spoken more wonderful things in the future. In other words, God has brought you safely. God has seen you through but the future is incomparably better. That's what David is saying. And then he adds that phrase that knocks it out of the ballpark. He says, this is a principle for all humanity. <laughs> oh my goodness, dear people. Are y'all sitting in concrete? Somebody needs to jump up and run around or do something. Amen? Front row, girls. Amen? Teenagers. Make me come down there and deal with you here. Now, I will give you a little caveat. The King James Version, um, go back to, uh, yeah. The King James Version says, uh, puts it a question. Is this the instruction for mankind? Is this your manner for, to all mankind? But most of the versions recognize that that's ill-fitting. The Hebrew does not have question marks. So the translators had to guess. Here they guessed wrong. Because there's no question marks in Hebrew. Is it an observation or is it a question mark? And I think the ESV and the Holman Christian Standard, the Holman says this is a revelation for mankind. This idea of the future is better than the past, no matter how good the past is. This is a revelation for mankind. You've got your revelation today. You got your word from God today. Lay hold of it by faith. Speak it out. 
pray it down because it belongs to you. It's a Torah. It's a law, a precedent, a principle for all humanity. The future is better no matter how good the past. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we rejoice today in your goodness, your, uh, your grace, your mercies, your promises. We thank you for this covenant you've made with David and how it applies to our lives. Uh, we thank you that ultimately is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And so we gladly worship you today. We gladly offer our tithes, our gifts, our donations to your word and work through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've promised to build a house, hold a family, and that we're part of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.